it's eight o'clock. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Marvelous Medicine. Today's topic is respectful maternal care. We have two eminent speakers with us. Dr. Manju Puri is the director professor of, of obstetrics and gynecology at Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. Uh, she did her MBBS and MD from the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Rohtak. Dr. Puri is the chairperson, Safe Motherhood Committee of Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Delhi. She is the national coordinator of Practical Obstetric Committee of Foxy and the president of the National Association of Reproductive and Child Health of India, Delhi. Dr. Puri's field of interests are high-risk obstetrics, reproductive endocrinology, and quality improvement. She has edited three textbooks and is an external quality assessor for public health facilities. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manjupuri, for accepting our invitation and jo joining us at such short notice. Second speaker will be Dr. K. Aparna Sharma. She is a professor, Division of Maternal and Fetal Medicine, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Aparna did her MBBS from Institute of Medical Sciences, Banaras Hindu University, and her MD in Obstetrics and Gynecology from Maulana Azad Medical College, Delhi. She was a senior research fellow in fetal medicine at Ames, New Delhi, and did her fellowship in maternal and fetal medicine from Barcelona, and has expertise in fetal interventions. Aparna is the Secretary, Society of Fetal Medicine, Chairperson, Multiple Pregnancy Committee, Stillbirth Society of India, Chairperson, AODD Quality Committee, North Zone Coordinator, Safe Motherhood Committee of Foxy, Co-Convener of Early Pregnancy SIG, Indian Fertility Society. Aparna was a Kamini Rao orator in 2017, which is a prestigious oration for young members of Foxy. Uh, uh, welcome to the show, Aparna. Moderating the session will be Dr. Mini Ravi. She is the consultant obstetrics and gynecology, SSMC Mayo Clinic, Abu Dhabi, UAE, and adjunct assistant professor, Khalifa University and Gulf Medical University, Ajman. She did her MBBS and MD and DNB obstetrics and gynecology from Jipma Pondicherry, which is my uh, uh, college. And uh, she was awarded Dr. Seshadri Pani Memorial Oration for Young Obstetricians and Gynecologists of India while for her dissertation during her post-graduation. Mini subsequently completed her FRCOG in UK and did a clinical fellowship in operative and diagnostic hysteroscopy and uh, also a diploma in gynecological endoscopic surgery from the University of Kiel. Mini is a certified manager of quality and has also done a postgraduate diploma in business analytics. She has received several awards in different categories in Abu Dhabi and her special interests are Maternity Enhanced Recovery Program, Surgical Site Infections in Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Low Risk Ambulatory Care and Connected Care. Maybe after the talk, you can tell me what connected care is, uh, Mini. Thank you for joining at such short notice. Over to you, Dr. Puri. So a very good evening to all of you. And it is indeed a matter of great honor to be here amongst this August uh, group uh, and talk about uh, respectful maternity care. Uh, now, uh, respectful maternity care uh, is also uh, known as humanization of childbirth. So it actually emphasizes the need to humanize birth, taking a woman-centric approach. Now, we all know that uh, in the older time when majority of women were delivering at home, they were surrounded by their relatives and uh, the person who would conduct the delivery would be known to the patient. So everything was kind of warm in the comfort of the home. And ever since the women started coming to the hospitals, uh, they, uh, you know, especially in the public hospitals, so somehow uh, they have started delivering alone. I'm to say we don't uh, allow birth companions. We uh, kind of, you know, they do not, they are surrounded by people who are not known to them. So uh, WHO came up with this concept of uh, you know, the, uh, the experience of uh, uh, care which they receive. So it is not only about birthing safe, but it is what the woman would feel uh, or what would be her experience like. Is it a positive birthing experience or not? I think that is what uh, stays the focus because that is what also uh, uh, you know, has an impact uh, on the outcome of the mother and the baby 
and the way she would progress through her labor. So WHO defines uh, good quality maternal and newborn care as a care, effective, timely, efficient, equitable, and people-centered. So one of the very important yet overlooked aspect of maternity care is respect, dignity, and emotional support using effective communication. So somewhere down the line, uh, this particular component has uh, kind of uh, received a lot of thrashing, and we have ignored it. We have ignored it uh, substantially. Good quality care has also been recognized as an important factor, uh, which would further uh, promote institutional delivery. So if a, uh, if a mother goes satisfied with the services which she receives at the facility, she's bound to motivate others to come back, uh, to come to the hospitals for their deliveries. Uh, it also improves the birth outcomes uh, because the anxiety which the patient would have during labor gets translated into uh, you know, the hormones, uh, uh, hormonal changes in a body, which then get circulated to the baby and are, are definitely bound to have some kind of impact on the baby. And also uh, the hormones uh, uh, which are produced during birth in case uh, she's anxious, she's stressed, uh, they're bound to be more of catecholamines, vis a -vis, uh, the happy hormone that is the oxytocin, and hence the progress of labor and other things are also going to get affected. Uh, it also determines the patient and her family's future health-seeking behavior. So if her experience uh, of birthing uh, is not uh, positive, uh, she is unlikely to uh, seek help uh, uh, in the later times for herself and her newborn. Um, you know, she would be scared of coming back to the facility. So a woman's experience uh, with healthcare providers in labor rooms can either empower or comfort them, or they can inflict long lasting damage or emotional trauma. Now, these are certain verbatim uh, you know, sentences uh, which might uh, sound very harsh. Uh, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, one might think they, are, they may not, you know, it's not possible that one would talk like this, but th these are true. Uh, sayings which have come up from uh, the uh, you know literature which is published, uh, something like uh, you know if the woman is asking how long will it uh, take, uh, Abhi, you know how how much time uh, is she uh, to uh, you know have uh, uh, to be, birth the baby, so they would say hame pata nahi leti raho bar bar mat bulao, so pareshan kara hua hai tumhare rishte daron ne aise karegi to ilaj nahi hoga tumhara yahan pe. Something like itla chilao matrani, hamara sirdar dhura hai. Agar jo nahi, jor nahi lagayegi, to bache ki dharkan kharaab ho jayegi, or bacha khatam ho jayega. Bacha tumara hi to hai, dard bhi to tumhi bardasht karna padega. You know, it's absolutely uh, uh, very crass kind of comments, uh, which uh, anyone, uh, you know, it's not uncommon. Uh, it is pretty common. Uh, it is uh, more common in public hospitals. Uh, of course, uh, in private hospitals, uh, patients are not going to take this from the doctors uh, and also from the, uh, you know, support staff. Uh, but uh, still, uh, it is there in some form or the other. So uh, this is what the reality is. And that is why we have started talking about respectful maternity care. So this was an elegant review which was published by Bauer and Hill. Uh, and uh, they looked up all the literature which was available in the form of case reports, interviews, and uh, you know, articles regarding the respect around or the care around the birth and uh, what was the experience of the mothers like. And they came across these uh, seven areas, uh, categories of disrespectful care, which were there all across the world. So this was global. Uh, physical abuse, non-dignified care, non-consented care, non-confidential care, discrimination, abandonment or withholding of care, and detention in facilities. So I think uh, all those who are in public facilities would understand, and even in uh, private facilities would also understand that this does happen. So they were uh, based on this, there were seven rights of uh, childbearing uh, women, which were uh, kind of uh, proposed, and uh, they are based on international human rights declaration and conventions. So for physical abuse, for each of these uh, disrespect uh, categories, we have a corresponding right. So physical abuse, it is freedom from harm and ill treatment. Non-consented care, 
It is right to information, informed consent and refusal, and respect for choices and preferences, including the right to companionship of choice uh, wherever possible. So women need a uh, birth alone. They should have a birth companion of their choice, whatever kind of facility it is. Non-confidential care. So the corresponding right is confidentiality and privacy. Non-dignified care, including verbal abuse. So the right is dignity and respect. Uh, discrimination based on specific attributes. The right is equality, uh, freedom uh, from uh, discrimination, equitable care. Uh, then for abandonment or denial of care, it is right to timely health care and to the highest attainable level of health. And as far as detention in facilities is concerned, it is the right to liberty, autonomy, self-determination, and freedom from coercion. So this is the uh, charter which was uh, released, and these are the seven rights. So we just go uh, one by one through each of these rights. So first is freedom from harm and ill treatment. So uh, we know that uh, ever since uh, uh, women have started coming to the, coming, coming to the facilities and uh, delivering in hospitals, uh, the use of interventions, which is not evidence-based, has increased. So uh, episiotomies, induction of labor, uh, cesarean sections, unnecessary antibiotics, and say the whole lot of things which we keep doing, which are actually not desirable, and uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so sometimes we say it is a patient who is demanding, sometimes it is for the convenience of the doctor, sometimes uh, the doctor is not aware of uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the actual evidence-based uh, practices. So whatever the reasons may be, but the use of interventions uh, is what is uh, happening and which is not uh, in the, for any good of the patient. Causing physical harm during uh, shifting the patient. Say the patient is being shifted from one place to another. If we don't take care, I'm saying she, there could be, uh, you know, uh, she can fall off the table or things like that. Then insult, intimidation, threaten, or hit the patient while performing procedures. So, uh, you know, uh, we've had people, uh, uh, we've had uh, situations wherein the doctors have lost their cool. You know, they feel that, uh, or the nurses have lost their cool. They feel that, uh, you know, they're overworked. That is fine, but, you know, there's no reason why we should uh, hit the patient, either with the instrument or forcibly separating the legs to do a per vaginam examination where the patient is not, uh, you know, um, uh, cooperating. So uh, that is uh, not desirable. So uh, that is what is important, that first we should do no harm. That is one of the basic pillars uh, of uh, you know, the care which we are going to provide and then not do anything which is not evidence-based. The second is right to information, informed choice and refusal and respect for choices. Now, uh, say it is not about public and private again. I'm uh, you know, mentioning it because you know, when, we, uh, when there is a patient who is uh, wanting a cesarean section, and uh, or a doctor which, who proposes a cesarean section for a patient, elective cesarean section, it is not that we always tell them what are the disadvantages of cesarean section subsequent uh, in the later pregnancies. So that is very, very important that we uh, quite often would miss out on telling them that there are chances that she can have a morbidly adherent placenta next time, which would mean she would have a hysterectomy and which would also mean that she could lose her life if she wants to have another baby, scar ectopics, the n number of things which go with the baby being born uh, by uh, cesarean birth. Uh, and also uh, the non-exposure of the baby to the uh, met uh, uh, maternal vaginal microbiome, uh, all that problems which the baby can have subsequently because of this non-exposure uh, is something which is important. And I don't think so we give all this information to the patient when we decide and we say that we are doing a cesarean because the patient is insisting that we should do a cesarean. A woman has a right to choose one uh, birth companion to be with her during delivery, whether it is a heavy load facility or it is a you know, private sector. It is important that the pay, uh, no woman should deliver alone. I'm saying uh, 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 childbirth is something which is uh, the most crucial time of her lives. And it is important that she should have some person, uh, whom, uh, person of her choice to be with her and support her during this process information and support on positions of labor and birth, uh, fluid intake, emptying of bladder regularly, exercising, uh, exercises for labor, early initiation of breastfeeding. Um, let's understand that not all these uh, things are actually this information is provided and uh, uh, not that we support them for all these uh, you know, uh, 
um, things. Uh, it could be because there is heavy load, but I'm sure uh, it is. if it is useful for her, uh, it is important that we do inform them about it. We have to find out a mechanism wherein uh, these are their rights. And say we need to tell them what is good for them and what they should be doing. Uh, confidentiality. Uh, now, patient records should be kept in a secure place, inaccessible to general staff or visitors. Uh, personal details about any client should not be discussed publicly. And this quite often you can see people publicly discussing their patients. Uh, you know, if you are surrounded by patients who are uh, in the process of labor, and say when you give over, uh, so generally you see you keep telling this is so and so patient, this one is an unmarried, uh, she is HIV positive. So you know we are uh, casual as far as. Uh, uh, you know, talking about uh, patients, uh, personal details of the patient is concerned. Uh, then information about the progress of labor of a woman or complications, if any, should not be stated aloud as other women may hear about it. So uh, it is very, and uh, even if you have a patient who is not cooperative, so uh, you fi find the staff discussing amongst uh, themselves that this patient is uh, a problem patient. So, you know, things like this need to be avoided. Dignity and respect. Now, examination tables and de delivery beds should be separated with screens. This is absolutely a doable thing in public uh, healthcare settings as well. Uh, expose only the appropriate body part, uh, body part during the examination. And then once you've done the examination, cover the patient back. So these are small, small things, but it is, uh, you know, they get missed out. Um, uh, the reason may be because we are not trained to take care of these things. These softer skills are not uh, kind of... Uh, uh, told to us it is not a part of our curriculum. Uh, although now uh, with the EDCOM model coming uh, in, I'm to say we do have uh, emphasis being laid to it, but in our day-to-day -day teaching programs, in our day-to-day -day practice, uh, these things do get diluted somewhere. Then explain and take consent before any examination, especially when we do a PV examination in labor. Then share the findings of an examination with the woman and her family, right? And then listen to the woman carefully. And uh, uh, whatever, uh, you know, whenever uh, a woman calls uh, during labor, it is important that the, uh, you know, the nurse and the doctor should at least listen to her so that, you know, she feels that she's being heard and there are people who are going to take care of her. Equality, freedom from discrimination and equitable care. Uh, now, we all know that, uh, uh, you know, depending upon the patient's caste, religion, socioeconomic status, her, uh, how educated she is, which uh, uh, strata of society does she come from? Um, is she a VIP? She's not a VIP. And then um, her HIV status, et cetera. A lot of discrimination does happen. A lot of discrimination does happen. Uh, so I think it is important that we uh, ensure that all the mothers, irrespective of caste, creed, anything, uh, the care should be equitable. Timely healthcare and the highest attainable level of health. Uh, it is important uh, that whichever space uh, place we are, depending upon the load at that facility, we should be able to organize our work in such a manner. I'm sure Aparna will take you through the uh, point of care quality improvement methodology. There are methods available. It is just that we have to empower our healthcare providers to uh, identify their problems and uh, then solve them one by one. So nothing is impossible. So, but the only thing is we have to uh, identify, list out our problems, prioritize them, and then fix them one by one. So if a labor room is busy, it's important that we organize the labor room and related areas in a manner that enables prompt, complete, and quality care for every mother and newborn. Say uh, we can have our inductions on one side, we can have uh, you know, um, um, primary patients on one side who need more care. And you know, so that kind of organization should, uh, should be there. We should not leave the mother unattended. We should ensure that every mother and newborn receives full package of services at the right time in a correct manner. So the skin-to-skin uh, 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 -skin contact, uh, early initiation of breastfeeding, all these things uh, must be done. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, you know, uh, in the private sector specifically, the baby is taken away from the mother and uh, the baby is kept in the nursery for observation. Uh, for uh, you know, 24 hours or 48 hours, uh, that is undesirable. We are de uh, depriving the mother uh, of whatever uh, uh, healthcare she should be receiving. So these are evidence-based practices and they need to be followed. 
ensure recommended practices for infection prevention for every client. Uh, this is very, very important. The last is liberty, autonomy, and freedom from coercion. So liberty of decision-making. Say We say that uh, the patient is uh, not, uh, she's asking for a cesarean, right? And we do more cesareans now because our patients are asking for it. But after all, uh, we, uh, it is important. Uh, why would the patient ask for cesarean? We need to talk to her. We need to, uh, you know, apprise her for the be benefits and, uh, uh, you know, disadvantages. And then it should be an informed decision making. Uh, inductions of labor. We just uh, decide on induction of labor. We do not give any other options uh, or any alternatives to our patients, especially for uh, pa uh, induction past date. The moment she crosses her uh, EDD, uh, you know, we don't give her that option of uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, she can continue for another week and uh, wait for the spontaneous onset of labor. Uh, so it is somehow, uh, uh, we uh, most often dictate things uh, and it is not a uh, decision making. It may be because of uh, avoiding medical legal, uh, you know, litigations or whatever, but uh, we do deviate. Uh, from what is evidence-based. Uh, then the patients uh, may be discharged early if they're not willing to stay after explaining the consequences. In government uh, hospitals, we often see that the patients are wanting to go home and because they are sick, we want to keep them in the hospital and uh, we feel that they, if they go home, they will not be taken care of, but then they go Lama. So that is left against medical advice. Then when they go Lama, they do not even have a slip. So that means a patient whom we were not discharging we were, because we were worried she would not be taken care of at home, she goes home without any treatment and without that option of coming back also open. So it is important that, uh, you know, I remember a story when there was a patient who was wanting to go home and no one was allowing her to go home. So I asked her, I said, what is the problem? Why don't you stay back? She said, I have two little daughters who are alone with my neighbors. So there's every reason this uh, lady wants to go home. So I think it's important that we should do discharges on request and allow the patient and listen to the patient and help them uh, with whatever we can. So respectful maternity care is the right of all pregnant women. Uh, it is uh, the predictor of health seeking behavior of our future generations. It should be in the DNA of all the health systems and can be provided without any additional resources. It is sad that we are discussing uh, this here uh, at this forum, but uh, believe me, it is not a problem only which is, uh, you know, India-centric. It is global. It is global. Uh, the disrespect and the, uh, you know, the uh, harm or the negative uh, experience which a woman get may be different in different places, but it is there in some form or the other. Remember maternal and newborn care if look through the prism of quality, has to be safe, has to be timely, has to be equitable, has to be effective, has to be efficient, and has to be patient-centric. So nobody can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make it a new ending. So with this, I would end my talk and hope that we take forward this movement of making a childbirth uh, or a pregnancy, a positive experience for all our mothers. Uh, thank you so much for patient hearing. Thank you so much, Dr. Manju. Over to you, Aparna. We'll uh, take the questions and discussions at the end. Is that all right? Yes, ma'am. So I'll just start. So a very good evening to all of you. And I'm really thankful uh, for the team of Marvelous Medicine for having us here. And I must thank Tilaka. She's a very good friend and she's the one who introduced us here. So uh, what ma'am has said so far is uh, uh, very vital and we are both very passionate about this journey. And I would talk a bit about what we have done so far. This is just the beginning where we have started. And uh, I would like to talk about uh, why we started started ma'am has given uh, an overview and um, you know and what is the path that we have taken it is easy to say that you know it is something that needs to be done I think this is like something that really doesn't actually need to be said but what is important is how do we plan to go about it what we are doing what we have done 
and uh, what is the like you know the content that we're talking about and uh, what, what are the next steps to it so these are the you know various um, aspects that i would be covering but before that just to build up the adrenaline a bit i would uh, just share a video uh, which featured was featured by the time magazine which actually gives and states the hard facts so i will just take 2 minutes of the time to share some of the facts here like ma'am said it is not just an india problem it is across countries across continents that this problem exists and the main problem is that we it is so difficult to measure the mistreatment about what is happening this has been existing for decades but how do we say how do we measure respect how do we measure rmc and improvement if we want to say it is improvement we need to understand and try and objectivize it so uh just going through this paper we talks about mistreatment measures so verbal abuse use of harsh language failure to meet professional standards lack of informed consent physical examinations and procedures lack of privacy no partition between beds conducted examinations without information or privacy and provider did not cover the mother during examination so breaking down the uh, concept of disrespect and abuse uh, and abuse into first order second order and third order themes in order to understand how we can actually go into the depth of the problem and uh, try and elicit what needs to be improved is something that we are actually going down into it also there are aspects to clinical quality that is creating rapport rapo so essentially basic things like welcoming in a gentle manner calling the client by name a very basic thing like calling a lady by her name is rare and telling her where to go where to wait that is something that also needs to be looked into basic practices of taking medical history physical assessment of course that also needs to be assessed so uh, when we actually uh, try to understand all of these things so this paper actually said that the Uh, prevalence of all these problems was to an extent of fifty to eighty percent, somewhere ranging to even to that extent up to between fifty to seventy percent. So we know the prevalence of mistreatment is huge, but to objectivize it and try and understand what is the prevalence in all aspects across various facilities was something that we are looking into to try and change, and where to intervene. So with this background, we started a movement. and we named it a uh, the sarthak initiative sarthak is sensitive attentive respectful timely and humanized care so 
uh, and it is also to be believed that when a child is actually born, the mother is also born. So let mothers be born with safely and with respect. So to begin with, the respectful maternity care bundle has to be launched. And this is a movement that needs to be, you know, really pushed and, uh, you know, it has to go on full steam ahead. So in this particular in initiative, we uh, brought together the AOGD. AOGD is the Association of uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Delhi. It's a huge body of uh, the, all of the obstetricians who are practicing in Delhi, WHO India country office and the QI committee of AOGD. QI is the quality improvement committee, which was initially started by Dr. Manjupuri ma'am two years back. And now uh, we are together in this committee and we thought of taking this aspect forward. And now madam is also leading the NARCHI, which is the National Association of, Re of Reproductive and Child Health of India. And she's the president. And under NARCHI, the rest of the initiatives are being taken forward. So after coming together, we decided that there is a huge need to take this aspect forward. And as a first step, we started this program and uh, to create the learning resources and toolkit for training the professionals and to develop the catalysts of change, the master trainers for this Sarthak toolkit and to provide a platform for dissemination of this toolkit. And once we have had these master trainers and provide, we have disseminated this, we need to build advocacy for incorporation of this version or, you know, an abridged version or a modified version into the undergraduate and the postgraduate curriculum. Because unless we train the future doctors, the concept of respect cannot be sustained. So this has to be trained right from the beginning. And this is the, con the, the idea that we need to build an advocacy brief on the pilot implementation for scale up for the pre-service and in-service education. So with this concept in mind, we have started this movement to across Delhi for now. And in the first step, we have done the training of trainers uh, meeting, which was done on the 6th of December uh, of this year. Uh, where we included nine uh, institutions across Delhi, which included medical colleges, which included district hospitals, and also, so this particular, med this, uh, the TOT, which was done in Maulana Azad Medical College, it included medical colleges and various uh, other hospitals. And interestingly, this was actually an amalgamation of people from the medical colleges who were professors, who, was te who were teachers, but also in-service nursing uh, leaders who were already working in labor rooms and they, or they were also nursing tutors from the nursing colleges. So we had a very good and interesting discussion. And following this, uh, during there was another meeting within the next within the next week where I'm like I mentioned Narchi is an association which is currently being headed by Manjupuri Madam, and in which the Delhi government has taken up this initiative very soon after. So the Maternal Health Division of the Delhi government has taken up this initiative to spread this movement into the district hospitals of Delhi, where eleven facilities from from the Delhi government attended this. Uh, orientation workshop and understood this concept and has committed to a cascade training within each of their facilities. So currently we are at a level where we have commitment from at least 10 to 15 facilities for taking this up within the city of Delhi to do this workshop in their own uh, you know, facilities. So this was the 6th to 7th uh, December workshop. Now the component of workshop, what are we training? Now respect is such a fluid term. What are we trying to tell them? So the first concept is to tell them birth needs. And it is such an interesting concept that, you know, when a mother comes to a facility, she has certain expectations that, okay, there is certain uh, expectation from the facility, certain expectations from the provider. While the provider who's providing the birth uh, facility to the mother is, is actually, you know, in, in a uh, very clinically providing care. Now, what are the expectations match or mismatch between the facilitate the person who's providing care and the person who's expecting care? So that is the first activity that is done in this workshop to understand the mismatch or the match that is there. And there is a huge component of the communication. And whether we agree or not, somewhere as doctors, we miss out on communication. There is no formal training on communication methods. While communication is one of the most important aspect 
whether it is emergency, whether it is routine care, while obstetrics is such an emergency based, uh, you know, during labor room, intrapartum care. So there is a huge session on communication. And the third aspect is simulation. Now, people will think, why simulation? Simulation is for obstetric emergencies. How are we teaching respect through simulation? But it is so important because respect is the first thing that goes out of the window in an emergency situation is respect. So unless we hardwire respect into our system, that even in under very, very strenuous situation, we have to be respectful, this is not going to happen. So there are scenarios where we talk about respectful maternity care during labor, during PPH, during shoulder dystocia, we have to be hardwired and talk and behave in a certain manner. And that is what. So this was an initiative with a difference. We had two full days, two half days of a virtual workshop, two full days of a physical workshop where we talked about respect, they, like, you know, for the, for the full days in various manner. So that is something that, that, that was a huge, um, I think, initiative. And we, we really feel that, you know, we talked about it in all forms. So messages like this, I know this is a South Indian audience and may really not connect with the, so much of Hindi, which is being written here, but simple things like, you know, uh, the, the concept like Hamare yaha janam dena ek mahila ke liye bohat anand mein anubhav hona chahiye. It should be a happy occasion, not that it should be a fearful experience. So messages like this, they cut across populations and they reach out to the people. And when you write it, somewhere subconsciously it goes into the healthcare providers it goes across to the patients and the healthcare providers and we talked about the various communication techniques that that are very important across the normal situations across emergencies so following the first workshop we had another workshops in lady harding medical colleges where the all the delhi government facilities 11 delhi government facilities came in and they were so enthusiastic about the concept of respect and they agreed that this is something that needs to be done. And all of them have, commit, have committed to doing this in their own workshop. And the first one is being done in Maulana Azad Medical College itself on the 30th of this month, where they're going to talk about RMC with their own residents and the nursing staff of the labor room. So till the time that it goes down and percolates in each and every medical colleges, uh, you know, that is the end point where we think it is going to be there. Now, a very basic question I think will be in each and everybody's mind. And I think that is where we started is that what are we trying to accomplish? And all of you who have done quality improvement or are, are aware of this IHI's model, Don obedience model would say that how will we know that this is an improvement? What are we doing? You know, and this is where the quality improvement principles come in. And me and ma'am, we have been working together in quality improvement for the last five years and we've done various projects, work together on collaborative projects. And so whatever we do, we try to quantify. We try to understand that whatever we are doing, is it going to change? Is it actually an improvement? So unless we objectify this, talking about respect is not the end. It's nice to talk about it, being very emotional about it, but till the time that we prove it, it doesn't go anywhere. So from the paper of the mistreatment that we talked about, we decided that you know, we can kind of objectivize it by taking 10 parameters, which are very, very clearly seen or documented. Now, this is a proposal that we can do in our setup. It is not watertight. People can take up what they want to do, but planning a quality improvement project on RMC. Now, this is point of care quality improvement model that we have developed along with WHO India, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Neonatology and Gynae Department together. This has been for more than eight years now, we've done N number of projects, lots have been published, lots work done. This model really talks about four steps in QI where you talk about identifying a problem, forming a team, writing an aim statement, analyzing the problem, developing and testing changes and sustaining the improvement. Now, putting RMC into QI is something that is going to tell us that, okay, what are we doing? Is it going to help? Is it helping? Do we need to change? So this, these are some of the uh, QI methods, uh, utilizing QI methods, some of the publications, just to say that, you know, this is something that we have experimented with. We have been working on quality improvement methodology for the last so many years, and we believe firmly that this is the way 
forward, even when we are trying to implement RMC. So we have taken this 10 point objective scale for scoring a RMC in any setup like our labor room or any labor room. So if you've made a 10 point scoring system, we have to identify a problem that inculcate the practice of RMC during labor. And during who are the team members? We will include the LR residents, our staff nurses, nurse in charge, faculty in charge of the labor room and sanitary staff, because those are the people who are interacting with that. And what is my aim statement? It is to encourage the practice of RMC during childbirth by objectively improving the parameters of rapport, disrespect, and abuse from the current level by at least 50% over the next six months or the next three months. So that is something objectively that I have made my aim statement to work on in my setup. Now, this template gives us whether your aim statement is good, do you need extra resources, uh, why is it important to do this quality improvement? And do you think your team is right? Do you have influential people? Do I need to have my head of the department on the team? Because maybe I need to uh, need the support of my head of the department. And how do I measure it? How do I measure it? So now suppose I say, one option is I can measure an individual attribute, like the number of women in whom the healthcare provider explained the procedure, like doing a PV examination before performing it, divided by the number of women who, who were observed. So that is one individual parameter for observing it. The option, the second option would be that you score it out of 10 because I have decided 10 parameters. So I allot one team member to score on duty days, observe one or two interactions on a duty shift, score out of 10 on the scorecard, which could be charted as a percentage and a weekly percentage calculated to reflect on the time series chart. Now, this is a plan where I can objectively score my progress. So this is how we plan, like, you know, the quality improvement uh, data can be planned, a lot of percentage, uh, a person to collect the data, a lot the data sources and how, and maybe uh, calc uh, collect the data, frequent, uh, uh, weekly data. And now the most important is what is your change idea? What will bring about the change in your system? To begin with one RMC orientation workshop, and posters on RMC, because I need to orient communication. I need to do, I need to tell them that, okay, this is your basic thing. It is really unfortunate that somewhere along the line, I have to teach respect. We have to talk and teach respect, but if we have to do, we have to do this. But yes, the first change idea is orientation and RMC workshop, but do we think that this is enough? Maybe not, but I, I'll try it out later. But the first thing that I'm going to do is do a workshop in my setting and see how it works. And this is my last slide that I'm going to talk about is this is an idea whose time has come. RMC is the way forward. The Lancet paper says that beyond too little, too late, too much, or too soon, we need to talk about respectful maternity care worldwide. There is no other way to it. If we do not provide respect, people will not come to our systems, however good we are. People will not access care. So respect is something that we need to inculcate in our healthcare providers in the future generation of healthcare providers. WHO recommendations talk about intrapartum care for a positive childbirth experience. And this Christmas 2022 article from BMJ talks about respect. So careful, kind care is our compass out of the pandemic fog. Whether you call it, call it the pandemic effect or whether you call it the generational effect, there is a lack of compassion. There is a lack of respect. And this is what we are fighting for. And we do hope that in this journey, we will find it somewhere. So thank you very much. And this is what we wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Puri and Aparna. Um, uh, Dr. Puri, would you want to add anything to what Aparna said since um, your talk was uh, more introductory? Yeah. So basically, I think uh, I agree with all what Aparna has said. And uh, we feel that there has to be a lot of advocacy as far as this particular aspect of care of mothers is concerned. And uh, this is the way forward which we feel. Uh, because everyone would say uh, the places are uh, very uh, busy 
and uh, you know uh, people uh, are very stressed and that is why they behave like this they do not have time but then i think it is time that we understand that it is not about uh, uh, the availability of time or uh, you know places being busy it is more about your own attitude your behavior and uh, your communication skills so that is something which is missing and that is something which has to be brought in our practices so that is all what would I, what i would want to add yeah, over to you mini <clears throat> Thank you uh, for this, uh, you know, beautiful exponential talks, actually saying that you're bringing about uh, extensive changes in the way maternity care is being practiced. Uh, I, I work in Abu Dhabi and the setup is slightly different from India, actually. But in my hospital, which is SSMC Mayo, we believe that patient care comes first. And since I work, I have been given the project to do the low risk ambulatory care where I am looking at now what is essentially being dehumanized. That is maternity care has become you know, removed from the fact that it is physiological process, something that is normal for most women, something that should be enjoyed. And you know, we are following a tick box. These women come first trimester, ta -ta 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 -ta, these things have to be done. We forget to talk. Now, what has what you are already aiming at, we have already started practicing in many ways. We also have classes for respect now. We really have, we have classes, you know, for instance, we do not, we should not use certain gestures for the patient. Like for example, like this, you know, you say, please wait, please wait, we cannot lift. We are not supposed to lift because this is humiliating to the patient by putting her down. We are not treating her as an equal. This is one. The other thing in our, we practice is midwifery care. So this is where, you know, you're already doing it wonderfully by, you know, it is for you, it's a step down, like you're teaching, teaching everybody else that this has to be done. What we were taught before and what we really need to teach others is that every patient, as you said, requires to have their own safe space and treat them as a triad, like, you know, the mother, the baby and the family to be treated together as one. And, uh, how much of midwifery is being practiced now? Because about us, we, about 80% of our deliveries is by midwifery. The patients, we attempt, we are not successful actually because of staffing problems, but we attempt to give one-on-one -on -one care. And this has led to a lot of, uh, what to say, is comfort and safety net for the patients. So Dr. Manju and Dr. Aparna, I'd like to have... So, uh, you know, we are also trying to have midwifery system coming in place and the government is uh, kind of pushing it, uh, also, uh, you know, pushing it now because in 2018, they came up with the guidelines and now uh, midwives are being trained. Uh, there are uh, a few initiatives which have been made in Telangana and they have the first set of midwives who are ready. And I think that is definitely a way forward. Uh, because that would uh, be a one-is-to-one -one initiative. Now, what I personally feel is when we talk about obstetrics and gynecology, we fail to understand that there are two specialties, separate specialties. So somewhere, uh, the people, the working hands, are not adequate to look after the mothers and to you know, give them uh, care which actually is required. So it is the obstetricians themselves also who are under a lot of stress, and the mothers are also under stress. So there is a mismatch between the care providers and uh, the uh, clients whom we have to look after. So I think midwives, if they are added as, an, as a new cadre, uh, it would be uh, providing additional hands. It would take the load off the uh, obstetricians to some extent, uh, as far as the low risk mothers are concerned. And it, it, it is a different concept altogether. So, you know, when the midwives deliver birth babies, it is more of a natural birth. You know, all those natural things which have gone off the track will come as a new package. That is what we are, you know, expecting. And that is why the midwives, I always uh, feel that the midwives have to be trained differently. They cannot be the normal nurses. They have to be out of the circulation. They have to be standalone nurse midwifery practitioners, nurse practitioners, midwives, whatever we call them. So I think that concept has to come in. So uh, we have to normalize childbirth. I think that is where we uh, yes, are. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, we have uh, Dr. Santa Singh, who is the director of RIMS. Um, um, Santa, you have your hand up. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. He's an obstetrics and gynecologist himself. Um, Santa, could you just uh, unmute yourself? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll come uh, back yeah. to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was a very nice talk. And uh, after a long time, I'm seeing the mini Ravi. So I'm very, very happy. And I was a co-examiner with Anju, uh, <laughs> with Anju. So it was very nice. And uh, to see you, very nice. And new concept is a very good one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, mini, do you want to address any of the questions in the chat box? Or comments? One minute. So, uh, as uh, till you go through them, uh, uh, Gosh, you've been logged in right from the beginning and uh, uh, typing away comments. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. Meanwhile, uh, Mini, can you just uh, prioritize the questions in the chat box? Thank you. Thank you, Vidya. This is an okay. excellent talk, much needed. But in my experience going to the OBG wine in Jipmer and subsequently in Chandigarh, when my wife was a resident, I would frequently visit her. There are different, women are very hard sometimes on women saying that this is a normal procedure. I have gone through it. So why should you create such a dilemma? So uh, men aside, women themselves are very cruel often on women. Having said that, um, even in, in Jipmer and other places, I saw exceptional care uh, even before this talk was there, taking all the highlights of these programs, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Manju and Dr. Aparna had this way before they created this. So there are women who are hardwired for these kind of behaviors of careful, compassionate care. But it is not uniform because the mentors are different the, because of the pressure of the public hospitals. Uh, it is different. So the way these things have been laid out, we whenever we have uh, human beings trying to control uh, um, an environment where there is so much interaction, all kinds of corrupt behavior comes. So we cannot rely on the goodness of an individual human being, however good they are, to carry on these behaviors and expected practice. So what has to be done is legislation, laying down all the expected care uh, and expected behavior and, and actually whip it into action. So there is not going to, there's kindness and compassion so much for people who are al already outstanding. They don't need this. But there are people who have no idea, but they can be modified. They can be changed by these outcomes. Uh, we have seen in Mayo Clinic that each of the behaviors have to be asked for. So it's not like you are the highest qualified OBGYN or something that you will get an admission in Ames. No. I know Dr. Randeep Guleria, who is my senior in uh, Chandigarh, how careful, compassionate person he is. And he was my senior at that time. I was so glad to see him as, end up as director of AIMS. So it, it stands to the leaders to do this, but it is not only talk. In Marvelous Medicine, we have talks on communication and all these aspects which have been talked about, SBAR and all that have been discussed. But is it being implemented in the thousands and thousands of hospitals in India? Probably not, but this is a great uh, movement in Delhi. Unfortunately, all the great things happens in Delhi and stays there. The percolation from Delhi downward is a very slow process. So what my request to uh, Dr. Manju Puri and Dr. Aparna is make it, make as much noise as you can. Um, it is such an important thing, make it. Um, you'll have a lot of pressures, both political, internal, um, but this is something to stand for women because it's such a, Regular process is thought to be, what is regular is thought to be um, like something to be dealt with. Doesn't matter uh, what kind of behavior you met out, but each woman is important and each behavior is important. At Mayo, I was one of the five members to attend a conference called GRIT. Uh, this is all women conference where they talk about all the behaviors of women who keep apologizing for all their things. They keep saying, I'm sorry, I had to do this. I have a family problem. I came late. And they have asked women to stop doing that. Stop apologizing. Uh, men do not apologize. If I come late, I come late. Like you go suck it up. So things like that, 
is so, I'm trying to, I'm going to this conference called Apricon in, um, and my wife who's also a Lady Harding uh, graduate is going there. There are only few women speakers other than OBGYN where there are women speakers, rest of the medicine, maybe Optel, there's a lot more dermatology. There is no percolation. So this is not happening in the surgical specialties as much as we want or the medical specialties. These are behaviors of respect in the hospital, it has to be everywhere. So you can have this massive thing in OBGYN, but if, if the residents don't, don't see it in surgery, don't see in orthopedics. In orthopedics, I was told there are three kinds of anesthesia, three or four, vocal, lo local, vocal, and tocal, which means just give it to them, right and left. Uh, so these were the kind of trainings that I have come through and they are so inappropriate. Uh, you laugh at it, but it's so inappropriate. So I'm glad that this is happening. Um, but I tell you, you have to be so mindful, even within Mayo Clinic and the best institution in the world, we have what is called whisperers. We have people, we have empowered our nurses, our front desk people to look out for bad behavior from doctors, to look out and report them. There is all kinds of reporting system which happens and action needs to be taken against the doctors, whoever he is or she is. And I have to, have to retract this. The biggest problem for women, especially delivering is women themselves, the midwives and some, and, and doctors. So as much as you're trying to preach to the rest, you have to look within your own department and see you have, you have gone through residency yourself, you realize, uh, who these uh, players are, and they're completely ob ob oblivious of it. There's a blind side. Like in SSMC, which is a sister institution of Mayo, you'll be fired right up. There is no way. You'll be fired. And if there's no consequence of bad behavior in Ames or Lady Harding or anywhere, you have a government employee, you're hired for life. Uh, nobody bothers about it because you're a VIP, is your father or mother or husband your patients will suffer regardless of whatever PDSA you do, whatever we are people bound to be corrupted. Um, as, as human beings, I'm sorry to say that until unless you legislate, put it through, codify it, expected behavior, we will completely detract from um, the norm. And that is the norm everywhere. So regardless of what paper comes out in BMJ and others, it, the leaders have to take action. And I think you are, I really compliment for what you're doing. And um, I've learned a lot. I took a lot of, um, I keep writing these things. So uh, thank you for your amazing, amazing talk, but you have a hard task. Uh, you're talking about 1.3 billion people and trying to work there. It's not easy. Whatever works in SSMC and Mayo will not work in your place. So you have to use the techniques you have and implement it using, um, going to the highest level of leadership and implementing it. So the director has to hear, uh, the, all the other chairs have to hear, uh, and the curriculum has to be heard, has to hear to what you have to say. So make a lot of noise, make a lot of noise and educate the, the patients. This is bill of rights. We have to hold doctors accountable and nurses accountable for bad behavior. Otherwise, it's going to happen. Sorry, I took a lot more time, but I, it's a very passionate thing for me. Um, and I was so happy to see that you're making a lot of noise, you're putting signs, but you have to go beyond publications. I mean, you'll get very famous uh, advocating it, but it has to be uh, to change a system. You have to imbibe those habits. Uh, and the, just having a system or procedure in place is not enough for change. So like uh, Dr. Ravi said that, um, Mini Ravi said that in Mayo we have what is called the need of the patient comes first. You have to feel the need of the patient. It is, there is no way other than that that you can change or transform care. Uh, but, but it has to start from you and you have already started it. Um, it's amazing, amazing talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ilango, uh, you had your hand up. You wanted to say something? Um, I, I fully agree with uh, Professor Ghosh. Um, one of the uh, gynecology and obstetrics was one of the most hated subjects when I was an MBBS student. The simple reason was that I had a memory of women being slapped on the thighs during the time of 
uh, labor and it left a very bad taste in me as a medical student so i never i mean i just scraped through and uh, only recently I, uh, during my um, uh, during this covid time i started teaching people a lot of obstetrics when they were returning from cas uh, cas countries uh, mbbs training and that's what got me interested so recently i've got all the stuff that is required for obstetrics and gynecology and this is very interesting your talk is very interesting there is another uh, thing which i believe that obstetrics also has to correct is the way they treat their own junior colleagues i think the toxic work environment is another factor which is indirectly reflected on to the patients it's very difficult to uh, avoid even in a private hospital um especially when there are residents and uh, junior medical officers in training uh, so these are my thoughts thank you this is a wonderful you, talk mini. it's a wonderful in initiative over to you mini yeah i respectfully disagree dr elango this toxicity is across all disciplines not only across ob gyn yes we do face it and by using this respectful maternity care to start you know as a base i think we are not going to be practicing tox toxicity further but this is something that pervades across most of the medical specialties not only uh, ob gyn maybe it's more evident there because you have lot of deliveries and i i honestly you know feel very much being an indian woman you know that you know we need we deserve the respect we need to be treated well by our physicians whether they be an obstetrician or any other specialty but in obstetrics the woman is at her most vulnerable in tamil we call it maru janmam just as yeah. uh, dr manju and aparna said rebirth you know the woman is at her most vulnerable and she can do nothing about it while she's doing a, giving giving birth you know she needs to be treated absolutely the other thing dr manju i had a question is uh, what about anesthesia epidural do you practice that as much as possible because i think that by empowering women to receive uh, obstetric analgesia you know that's one of the deepest form of respect we can give her so uh, dr mini can i take this so basically um, in uh, our institute what we have is the concept of birth planning uh, where we we invite every woman who's between like you know around 32 34 weeks and we offer them the option of uh, analgesia and we counsel them you know what happens when they go through labor birth companion analgesia mode of delivery and contraception so you know those concepts are covered and we offer analgesia to everybody and the uptake is around 40 to 50% so we are offering it to all it may not be available across institutions but uh, we so wherever it is available medical colleges they are you know and private of course it's available but in public facilities a lot of medical colleges do offer yeah so dr aparna you're saying even when offered one in two women decide not to take uh, uh... Yes. Option of yes. analgesia. Okay. Yes. Yes. And uh, so, and uh, can I just come in? Yeah. Uh, for you know, when we uh, many uh, when we talk about uh, uh, labor analgesia, I fully agree that this is one of the neglected aspects. And just by focusing on it, also would uh, add on as far as the respectful maternity care is concerned. But you know, small things like allowing them to move around and uh, having someone to give them, you know. massage back massage and uh, uh, you know when we look at uh, 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 midwifery led care there not many women would need actually require analgesia it is more because uh, you know there's so much of stress and anxiety that leads on to so much of catecholamines that the pain threshold per se goes low you know a well prepared woman may take labor pains uh, you know uh, uh, more positively so especially in fernandez hospital they have uh, tried and they, uh, ever since the midwives have come in they said their uptake of uh, epidural has gone down tremendously so it is not that uh, epidural should be available for all so especially in heavy load facilities where you have less of anesthetist there are so many other things which one can do uh, to uh, minimize the pain so you know because epidural is not available people don't do anything so they don't even give them the normal analgesics you know so it is all an unlaw so i guess that we should try and comfort them in whatever possible way it is and definitely we need to look at the pain management of labor yeah 
I, I have one more uh, uh, thing to raise. I read a very interesting uh, article about a time out because many women uh, complain about uh, this traumatic experience in the second stage of labor. There was one article, uh, I think a Swedish article, which talked about giving a small time out, like, you know, at that moment of time, you're able to discuss with a woman and tell her how this is going to go through. And this is another way you show respect to the woman and, you know, enhance her uh, childbirth, the, uh, you know, her enjoyment of childbirth. Yeah, it could also be an important safety point, right? Where, uh, because if you have a, you know, say like how they're telling in a government institution where we don't have a separate room for everybody, there is this huge labor room with so many cots and all that and, you know, identity issues and uh, patients not being called by their name. So this timeout would not only help to, uh, you know, prepare the woman, it would also uh, make sure there is no mistakes made as to uh, patient identity and other things. Um, yeah. So uh, Dr. Radha Pandian, a senior obstetrician, is also logged in. She's been typing all her comments. Uh, Madam, we'd like to hear from you straight. It's been so wonderful. I congratulate everybody, Madam Manju, Puri, and uh, Parna, and Dr. Mini Ravi, Dr. Amit Kosh. It's been fantastic. And I feel it's absolutely the necessary thing what you're doing is so fantastic because the government is loaded with so many patients and who are just left for their own fate and in labor rooms. In fact, I have worked in government hospital Egmore and the government hospital in Brunei and the private hospital in Apollo. I can see the difference. I could perceive the thing, how we have taken our private patients in a small batch versus a big load of government patients. And uh, in fact, one of the things which made me resign from government service was the absolute plight, as somebody recommend, commented here, the plight, patients lying on stainless steel board, cold boards without any cover, and patients shouting away in the last room and uncared for. Certain things are just traumatic in our memory. So I, I agree. Whatever uh, initiative you have taken is fantastic. And I really salute the people who have taken the initiative. And I wish, as Dr. Amit uh, commented, it goes across the country and helps the millions of people. Thank you so much, and I wish you good luck for your journey forward. Uh, Dr. Venkatesh, you have your hand up. Can we hear from you? Yes, ma'am. The uh, uh, question is, um, giving a very personalized care uh, in a country like ours, uh, especially as uh, what uh, madam was suggesting uh, um, is about occurring in other purposes, just like a war room might one another um, considerably from that that kind of situation about twenty twenty five years ago. Uh, now the question is uh, in educating the team in deliveries could be reasonably conducted. Uh, for example, is it possible to run five deliveries simultaneously with five different teams? Is that possible even in our country where it is possible to give personalized attention, where the team is very calm, composed, understand the nuances of uh, what, what when they cross the line, when rudeness uh, takes over. I mean, the situation, you know, becomes very tense and all that. But generally the common refrain is, People misbehave because it's very stressful, which probably should not be accepted as uh, accepted. So my question is, uh, uh, how many teams, how many members should be in a team in order to safely execute this? Aparna, would you like to take that question? Uh, Ma'am, actually, I think he, I don't know if it was my network or I couldn't get the question very clearly, but I think it was talking about heavy caseload facilities and, you know. Uh, he just wanted to know a uh, one whether yeah. in India it's even uh, possible to make sure there is a one on one like whether it's a midwife or whatever one caregiver for each uh, uh, birthing lady that was the first point and uh, 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 whether whether at all it is uh, 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 have you seen a place where whatever you were discussing was actually happening uh, have I got it right the documentation yes ma'am yes ma yeah so ma'am actually see the point is that like we said it is actually a perception that we are misbehaving because we are stressed 
we, because we try and justify our misbehavior because of so much overwork and stressed because it has become such a habit that we misbehave even when we are not stressed so what we are talking about here is hardwiring of a behavior which has already happened so essentially what we talk about here is and if you talk about the systems if it is already existing an ideal system i cannot claim that an ideal system is existing it cannot exist at this point in time but what we are seeking is that if there is a system which is majorly functioning without any major showdowns that is what we are looking at where there is no uh, mistreatment or abuse majority of the times and that is what we are targeting here because the people are trained not to shout at people not to shout at patients and this is what we are looking out one on one care in a public health care facility may not be possible but it is possible to treat women with respect to address them simple things like address them with name tell them before examining that look i am going to do an internal examination for you provide a cover curtain them provide a curtain and provide audio and visual privacy these are certain very basic things which will go a long way in improving care and providing the respect that we are talking about and have an environment like when we go into the labor room we say to the labor room team that look this is your area of work there should not be any shouting there is no disrespect in the area that you are handling and that where there you are having where in this area of work so this is exactly what we are looking for in a public setup where we might not and i would also like to say one more thing here i can see the comments there are people who say that i hate op gyni i have had developed a uh, hatred for ops gyni from the behavior that you know maybe they had so many years back we all understand we all have gone through the thing and this is where we want to you know really try trying to change the system here everybody has gone through somewhere that kind of a system but we are trying to change here and there's a huge movement from the government itself since 2016 onwards when the luxury labor room quality improvement project was launched where it is a mandate from the government to have a birth companion and birth companion has been proven across the globe to be a single most effective initiative to de decrease dis to decrease abuse and disrespect in labor so if you have a birth companion so even if it's a busy health load health case load facility there is a stool or a chair next to the patient where a birth companion is supposed to sit across healthcare facilities in india and this is a mandate and like dr ghosh said you need to have a legislation so this is actually a requirement from the government that you need to have a birth companion it may not be the husband because it's not possible when you have but you need to have you can have a female so you know there is a movement there's a huge movement so we have moved on from where we were 20 years back and all of us were undergoing our mbbs so we are trying to move towards a positive environment and there is a huge push right from the top and what we are trying is bottoms up approach where there is a push from the top but really it has to come also from the down so we think that it's possible but yes like dr ghosh said we need to make a lot of noise that yes it's possible and we should do it so small measures small in whatever way it is possible we cannot you know really change the infrastructure we cannot provide you know single cubicles but we can do what we can do by changing the behavior of one on one behavior when a person is talking to that lady that is what we are looking at so apna if i can just jump a little ahead uh, before you rolled out uh, you know in the official way and the collaborated with the delhi government and i am sure you did your own uh, pilot or uh, some uh, you must have been doing this for a while this uh, you know trying to uh, propagate respectful maternal care so what was your approximate timeline for you to see some change when you uh, like uh, the 10 points you you said uh, you wanted quantifiable uh, points and simple to not, not very complicated simple things that can be done also easily and can be confirmed also easily so you chose those 10 things was the woman greeted when she arrived and things like that so what was the approximate timeline for you to perceive change and did you uh, and ha, it, the change was from data that you collected or uh, from the patients or feedback that you uh, 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 collected from the moms or was it observed by some other healthcare professional 
so ma'am uh, exactly so essentially so when we uh, almost so this this thing we started even before the covid pandemic when we had uh, developed a checklist for uh, communication whether you know all of these things are being done in the labor room uh, what to what extent are these being followed so that is from that is uh, where it all started so right here and, and like a quality improvement project we took it up and uh, we generally have a timeline of 2 to 3 months where we talk about the change to come in in a certain population uh, in the certain residents who are posted in the labor room however the sustainability is seen over a period of you know 6 months to 1 year that is what we are looking at after that we've uh, actually through the lakshya initiative of the uh, of the government of india we've gone to various medical colleges across Uh, country and there also we have taken up certain qi projects on communication not in terms of exactly calling it rmc and including all of these components but we have done this project as effective communication during labor and in labor rooms across various medical colleges in the country and we have seen that it is feasible to be done but the sustainability of course will have to be seen over a period of time Uh, the, the, uh, my my question was about your own unit or your own area whether how long did it take for the change to actually be seen that was my question so like i said ma'am everything like 2 months to 3 months is the initial initiation time and then of course the sustainability so we initially put the changes so first is the orientation program then we have the posters and then we start taking the measurements every week so we have uh, every week and then we see so it's generally 2 to 3 months and then we collect data for over you know 6 months to 1 year right so uh, dr manju you wanted yeah. to say something yeah dr vidya actually uh, you know the, as far as these uh, this particular uh, set of 10 points is concerned this is what we have proposed and we are ongoing we are just you know in our hospital we will have a first workshop and move on but things like birth companion it was so much of resistance you know we have about uh, you know 60 to 70 deliveries happening every day so the labor rooms are full so there was so much of resistance from everyone no you know the they are going to obstruct our working and uh, you know the nurses were not happy the doctors were not happy but now we have so initial roll out for any qi project you know when we think of one intervention would be a period of about 3 months or so so anything between 6 weeks to 3 months but then as aparna said you know we now have birth attendants uh, companions with our patients the patients feel you know less scared they are more comforted and you know the people the abuse the verbal abuse also goes down because it is not the vulnerable patients alone it is the relatives who are observing so everyone is under that radar so naturally it has gone down but uh, you know we have to think of small small interventions and whatever is possible we first take that which will give us more results and will take less effort and then we move on to uh, the uh, more complex ones so i think now we are moving on to more complex ones which would mean that uh, you know the communication the way they talk to the patient and what are the contents of that you know thing talking to the patient by name taking permission so you know they would be gentler in their approach but they would not take consent you know they just put the patient they would not tell the patient the findings of pv examination but they would not you know uh, put pull the legs apart or would not be rough in front of the relatives so i think that is how the changes are kind of happening and that is the beginning and uh, as aparna says the government is now on board they want it to be rolled out they are talking about it i think once we start talking about it people who were actually taking it as a norm you know their right to be talking and behaving in whatever manner now they know that they are being observed and of course uh, you know for it to be effective i agree with dr amit when he says that there has to be legislation someone has to be a neutral person has to be observing and telling this is not correct so i think that is the way forward here so after uh, speaking of something serious um, i don't mean to be flippant but uh, this doubt uh, i have been working in the private sector for a long time now so uh, when we talk about patients rights and all uh, is having a cesarean birth uh, patients right when there is no indication yeah if, if the if the obstetrician refuses to do a cesarean where there is no indication for cesarean would that be disrespecting the woman or where 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 do we stand on that no 
uh, there a detailed consent and an honest consent is important. What, what happens is that uh, it is only the advantages part which is kind of told and the, uh, the complications. Say, if we, tell, if we explain them, that you can have, you know, the risk of anesthesia is more, or maybe you can have additions, you can have sepsis, uh, you can have, uh, you know, uh, uh, long term problems uh, in the baby. Uh, like, uh, you know, the baby is more likely to have uh, more autoimmune disorders because the baby is not exposed to the biome. So I think all those things, if we talk about, uh, then it is fine. If it is an informed decision, then of course you can go ahead if you feel it is okay. But somewhere the obstetrician is also given. I am say it is more to do with their practice and other things that, you know, it is more convenient for them. Uh, I feel it is something like female feticide. You know, uh, the, both the obstetricians and the, uh, the uh, ultrasonologist and the patient were on board because all wanted that. We all said we are doing because the patient is wanting it. You know, we are seeing the number of complications of cesarean section which are coming. And say, if we show them those pictures of cesarean scar pregnancy and morbidly adherent placenta, uh, we don't dissuade them. We agree to what they say. Uh, you know, we are also kind of gullible. Uh, that is what is my feeling that we do not stand, uh, you know, stay put. We feel it is okay. So we are, it's an easy way out for us also. That is what is my feeling. Aparna can come in yeah, and give her a uh, Mini has her hand up, uh, Mini. Yeah. Um, so there was about two years ago, the WHO, we found that there was a cesarean section epidemic, especially in Brazil, with a cesarean section rate of 80%. So 80% of women were undergoing cesarean section 10. And the primary cesarean section rate, that means every time a woman has a cesarean section for the first time should ideally be less than 10%, maximum of about 15%. So how can the cesarean section rate, like at consent, you know, when the woman wants it, are we allowed to refuse it? Isn't that the question? Which, as Dr. Manju has very, very clearly said, it, we have to get something like an informed consent, explaining everything to the patient. And it also depends a lot about the money and the insurance involved. Like if if it is being covered by the insurance, some of the insurances refuse to cover, cover it if it's being requested by the woman. There has to be a medical indication for a cesarean section. I think if the fright behind uh, undergoing a normal delivery is remote, possibly more women would be, you know, more willing to take uh, go on, go ahead with the normal vagina delivery. If my colleagues here, the doctors, they are terrified at taking ob just because of what they went through during their undergraduation or they're posting in the labor room. I can very well, we can, I mean, all of us can very well imagine what a woman would be subjected to listening to all the rumors, all the horrors, apparent horrors that are happening in the labor world, and she wouldn't want to be a part of it. If respectful maternity care is being assured for a woman, I'm sure she would very willingly want to go through labor. Ah, thank you, Mini. Yes, it is, I think, very well said, Mini. I fully agree with what you said. Yeah, Apana, you want to say anything about that? Yeah. No, no, I agree with uh, Dr. Manjupuri and Dr. Mini that, you know, I think it's uh, the counseling. And I we are somewhere lacking if we say, and we have to really, really, when we say informed consent, we have to present the other side. The problems with the cesarean and that is not being, in, in our practice, I don't think if we are actually counseling and the fear of labor, if we are dispelling that fear, we will not find as many elective cesareans that we are finding now. I think that is where we need to work on. And somebody has actually said that, can we pass on to a colleague if we are not uh, you know, agreeing to the idea with the patient? And I think that is very much uh, relevant with the abortions and MTPs that are happening these days. That if somebody is not really agreeing to do an abortion, we can, you know, I, you know, that is a personal choice to be done. But as far as cesarean is concerned, I think we must first fully counsel on the other side. If we, there is no indication, we really need to counsel. Yeah, so of course, the extreme case where uh, which somebody brought up on the chat box is this, for want of a better word, muhurat cesarean or what, uh, all kinds of times of the day and night where the uh, you know, the facility uh, is uh, stretched to its uh, limit and uh, there we don't have uh, adequate people. Um, we have juniors uh, available at night and so many things. So uh, uh, the respectful maternal care, the objective is something else <clears throat> uh, and uh, very much the need of the hour and something should have happened 100 years ago. But uh, at the same time, 
how do we stop it from being misconstrued as the patient can ask and get whatever they want? I mean, uh, the mother or the family or uh, whatever. So, Mini, you had your hand up? Uh, yes. There is one thing that, you know, starting from the top, right from the top in the government, we should actually do is to have courses on respect starting from undergraduation. In fact, it should be inculcated from schools. And as a medical fraternity, I think we are receiving the public's eye for what they understand as misbehavior or, you know, or uh, misbehavior from the doctors or wrong judgment from the doctors. This can be overcome only if we teach respect and this should be taught in medical college. Many of us come from diverse backgrounds. We have diverse methods of communication. I think we all of us need to understand that this is the way that we should behave. This is the way this should be taught. I'm sure that if this can be done, maybe in one or two decades, we won't be talking about respectful care at all because that will be the norm. Yeah, so uh, hopefully the uh, journey that has started uh, with the laboring mother actually cuts across all specialties and everything because respectful care is uh, it's the right of any any patient or any client or anybody, right? It, it's not just the uh, birthing mother. So we haven't even got it sorted out in all the other uh, 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 specialties. And I'm sorry to say that just in, uh, just because the institution is private or it, or the care is paid does not guarantee respectful care, whether it's obstetrics or otherwise. I, mean, I, I have been in the system uh, of private care for close to 30 years and uh, it's shocking. But uh, just just because the care is private or patients are less doesn't guarantee uh, respectful care or uh, all the components, uh, the informed decision making, consent for everything and anything. So most of the institutions are putting, you know, standard operating procedures and uh, trying to put all these systems in place. But like uh, Madam said, even simple thing like having a birthing companion is not actually the hundred percent of the time, even in the private setup. And I, 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 I've come to know only today that it's actually a law or it's a legislation. So, uh, so we can't just, uh, you know, dump everything that everything that goes wrong happens only in the public sector. Not true. There's a lot of stuff happening everywhere in all, uh, you know, um, private sector, corporate sector, the works. So <clears throat> we have uh, uh, my colleague from Fortis Bangalore, Dr. Gayatri Kamath. Uh, Gayatri, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, uh, apologies, I joined a little late. I'm sorry for that. But um, if I have to say, I think our postgraduate education in uh, the labor wards is a little uh, different from what we really practice because the numbers are so overwhelming that the element of empathy is grossly neglected because there are huge numbers in our government hospitals. So it becomes a very mechanical event and we forget the emotional aspect of a laboring woman. So in my practice, as I evolved from postgraduate to become a consultant, this slowly sank in that we are becoming very impersonal to women in labor. So that is when this respectful care comes in. And when you go through labor, it becomes all the more clear that how we need to, you know, when we are on the other side of the table, things really sink in. So I feel in when we are imparting education to our postgraduates, it's important to, uh, you know, emphasize how the patient feels and how to make them most comfortable. In my practice, I have been doing this uh, involvement of the partner in labor, and it has helped very much in progressing towards a normal labor because there is somebody from their team who helps them to support. I mean, that makes a remarkable difference. And even the RCOG states that having a you know supportive partner is one of the key elements for a blissful normal labor. Uh, regarding on-demand C-section, I fully agree with my colleagues here that we should put the other part of the story as well because they hear a lot of stories. And what I do in my practice is, we have a bunch of uh, people who have gone through normal labor and who sing the laurels of normal labor. We call them support groups for normal labor. So we generally tend to make people interact, people who have delivered normally so that they try to uh, encourage the others. And we uh, try to give patient information leaflets on the pros and cons of c-section when they decide to choose a c-section and i have some videos to just uh, you know explain and address fears during labor so all these can go a long way in trying to dissuade people for uh, no indication c-section the maternal request c-sections 
So I think this is where all of us, whether be it in the private or public sector, we need to uh, play our role in spending some time and trying to explain the both sides of the coin rather than just going as per their wishes. I wish I was a little early. I missed a large part of it, but I'm definitely going to look at the recorded version. Uh, Radha Krishna, you did that long write-up, uh, which I have promised to share with Aparna and uh, uh, Manju and uh, Mini. Uh, was this what you thought the session would be when uh, you wrote your introduction uh, this morning? No, actually, I'm, I mean, it's, I'm ignorant. I haven't heard of this word. Actually, I have no idea. But I also felt good that my gynecologist in my place where I work also haven't heard of this. I mean, I'm surprised that they are, they are not. They, they asked me, what is this respectful maternal care? You know, I got shocked when I was reading uh, words like obstetric violence and uh, stuff like that. Then I just want to see what is it all about? Is it, uh, you know, the violence from the medical fraternity or whatever? Anyway, it's, it's a wonderful talk. And actually, I'm really overwhelmed that the two of the senior most uh, uh, persons in the biggest hospitals in India you know, are, are in the forefront uh, uh, working on this. And, and I, I have great respect for you both for doing a wonderful thing like this. And actually, I, I should say, I uh, share my feelings with Ilango when he said that, uh, you know, this toxicity, et cetera. You know, the thing I notice, especially in public sector, is not just the doctors, the lower grade employees, the way they, the expletives they use and the, the words and, uh, the hitting, the screaming, it's its really, really pathetic. Actually, I thought it's a way of life. It's like a jail is treating some petty criminals in, in, in you know, jails. That's the way it used to be. And sadly, the women, and once they see the baby, they're, they're happy, they forget everything else, and they don't talk about it. I think that is the only way, you know, these things don't come out in the open. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful subject, wonderful topic, and as uh, Dr. Mini uh, rounded up, uh, you know, I think uh, this respectfulness should percolate to everything else. You know, we do many, many things as surgeons and physicians without telling the patient what we are doing. And uh, this rudeness is not just OBGN, it's all over. I'm sure the youngsters, the students, the MBBS students, nursing students, and even other hospital staff should be taught this in, in a very, very strong way. Great session, great talk, and you know, once again, I, I, my kudos to Dr. Aparna, Dr. Manjapuri, and Dr. Minirev. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we are kind of out of time, so unless Dr. Aparna, Dr. Manju, you have some closing comments, uh, get ready to wind up. So from my side, I think uh, we all need to take it forward. So irrespective of specialty, uh, I think uh, I think very valid point made that uh, you know, we are inherently rude, if you ask me. Uh, if you see, uh, if you go abroad, we only would behave in a very different manner because everyone else is behaving in a different manner. So somewhere down the line, uh, I think someone had made this comment that we need to inculcate this culture right from the childhood. And um, you know, we as quality uh, people, Aparna and me, would say that we don't look at what others are supposed to do. We look at what we can do. So we as obstetricians can definitely make an impact uh, as to, you know, when the students come to us, whether, you know, there's a first time uh, I, when I was taking a um, uh, class for undergraduates, I talked about respectful maternity, you know, officially uh, as a talk. And uh, they asked me, ma'am, aisa bhi hota hai, you know, that the patients can deliver in any position, uh, you know, they were so, so kind of, uh, uh, you know, curious to know more about it. And I think we need to introduce it. We need to make more noise. We need to talk about it at every forum and take it forward and take it forward. I think that is what is my closing comment. I, I look forward to it. Yeah. I, I would just say that, you know, when Tilaka asked me to talk about it, I said, you know, uh, the journey has started. Maybe, you know, I would love to talk about it after one year, but she said, no, no, you should talk about it. But I'm happy that you know we shared we uh, this this idea and i think uh, this is our first talk ma'am together on this and i'm sure we're going to you know have a lot of uh, experiences on this journey together and we do hope that you know we are able to make a difference to the place that we are working in so this is what we are looking forward to Any? oh it's so nice to hear from people who can really make a difference in you know governance and care across the country and i'm so glad to have been here listening to this happening 
And I don't know, respect is very important to me as a person. And I think everybody deserves to have this respect, be it a woman, a child also, you know, a baby also deserves all the respect. And I'm so glad that Dr. Manju and Dr. Aparna to be part of this, to listen to you both, delivering the change that women need in our country. Thank you. So uh, it's it's a wonderful way to wrap up this year. Uh, Marvelous Medicine achieved the major landmark of uh, having its 100th episode this year, but I think this outshines it because we have been part of something from the beginning. And normally Marvelous Medicine is coming into the picture only after things have already happened. People talk about what they've already done. But uh, it, uh, here we were able to join you at the beginning of your journey. And... Uh, like everybody's agreed, it's not just about a respectful maternal care, it's about respectful care for everyone. So oh, uh, you, I'm sure you have lit the spark in many of us and uh, uh, starting tomorrow itself, I'm sure we, are, we will be more mindful about everything that we do and uh, we will be more uh, mindful about what others are doing around us and uh, um, try to be more respectful. Thank you so much and uh, wishing you all a very happy and uh, safe new year and uh, we'll meet you again uh, next Thursday in the new year with a different episode of Marvelous Medicine where we'll be having a physician talk about all the non-medical things that she does in life to keep her stress uh, down. So uh, thank you everyone for joining in and making this session so interactive and it shows that the time has come by the amount of queries and comments that you had on the chat box. We hope to have a uh, Aparna and Dr. Puri again sometime uh, in the next year, maybe not only about respectful maternal care, about something else as well. So till we meet again, um, good night and stay safe. I'd like to give an applause. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.